Okay. Well, welcome everyone to a code mentor event. Uh, if you haven't signed up for their waiting uh, mailing list for uh, other ones, I highly recommend it because uh, every one I've attended has been super interesting and folks who really get really get code uh, and the magic of code. I am Matt Vanidly. I'm the founder and CEO of a software company called SEMA. Um, I heard a little bit of an echo. Uh, Antonio, I think you might not be on mute. Can you try going on mute? Let's see if I mute everybody. All right, I'm going to try that. Um, I uh, So our company um, uh, provides code quality assessments um, during uh, mergers and acquisitions. And uh, the reason I got really passionate about the topic of code and craft uh, is observing that uh, it was useful, in our opinion, to understand code um, through um, a code scan uh, in the course of a, uh, an investment decision, buying or selling a company, but it really didn't work. The same analytics that could, could be useful in that situation really were not uh, useful um, to, for, for day-to-day -day en engineering. Not only were they not useful, they were really disliked, really disliked. And so I set out on a journey. I interviewed a couple hundred engineers and really just tried to listen to what is it about code that makes it different? Uh, what, what are the implications for helping lead and organize an engineering team? Uh, and what, what do I know now that I, you know, I wish I knew, wish I knew earlier. And the summary of that is, uh, is that code, the one sentence version after a whole bunch of research and knowledge, and I know many people, this is straightforward, is that it really makes sense to think about code as a craft, uh, like other crafts, uh, pottery or woodworking, I think are pretty good analogies. Uh, it, it is a craft, uh, it is a craft and therefore managing engineering teams uh, and helping get the best from engineers uh, really has to take into account the, the practices, successful practices of uh, craftspeople doing their work. And so uh, I uh, got the chance to write a blog post about it uh, a couple months ago. I got a ton of feedback, uh, including that refined uh, my thinking even more, uh, which is always fun. That's the reason to do to have these kinds of conversations. And so what I'll do today is give you the highlights of it uh, and then really turn it over to questions. Um, there's nothing more fun in my view than a discussion rather than a speech. So I really hope you will be inspired to just start adding questions in the chat. Uh, if you just start typing, I will see it. Thank you, Brian, for helping me confirm the uh, confirm that the audio worked. Uh, but feel free to jump in with questions. And uh, if not, um, once I get to the main part, um, we'll open up the floor as well. So. So let's get started. Uh, what is a craft? If I'm going to assert that code is a craft and it's different from something called a competition, we have to define terms. Uh, and so let's talk about it. Uh, and this is, I, in my article, I said there were five parts to being a craft. And what I really got wrong was I forgot a sixth. And the sixth one is really important. So craft uh, is a skill that gets better with knowledge and wisdom. Uh, knowledge is the accumulation uh, 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 of facts and, and information, but wisdom is knowing what to use and when, and what context are we in, and given that context, what, um, what should we do? Uh, so that's part of a craft. Second, um, a craft is, uh, is energy producing, and uh, is energy producing for its own sake. Um, you think about many things, many jobs that people have in, in modern companies, um, they would not do them if someone was not paying them. Uh, and code, coding, I think is, it might be the largest job, uh, largest in terms of number of people doing it uh, that folks would do for free. Now, of course, I don't mean they necessarily would work for their own company, but the presence of open source, the open source community with um, hundreds of millions of participants um, is evidence to me that people code on their own, even if they're we enjoy it, even if um, uh, uh, even if it's not just part of a job. So crafts uh, enjoyment for their own sake. Third, 
a craft, participating in a craft can generate a flow state. So there is a, a very famous uh, psychologist who recently passed away. Uh, Michali is his first name, and I cannot do justice to his last name. If you want to know it, just ping me afterwards. It starts with a C-Z-I-K. And he discussed this notion of the flow state where you are fully engrossed and you lose track of time. Um, so that is uh, that is very much associated with craft. Uh, fourth, um, uh, fourth is the craft, uh, the finished product has to work. And that is a difference between craft and art. Uh, art can be incredibly impactful. Um, welcome everyone who's joining. Um, you'll, you'll definitely hear it as we go. Um, the craft has to work is different from art. Art can be beautiful, can be persuasive, can be moving, uh, but it doesn't have necessarily any functional uh, the ability to do anything. Whereas a craft, if it's a pot, it has to hold water. If it's a chair, it has to hold weight. Uh, of course, you're going to see where I'm going. Code actually has to um, not only compile, but actually also, also work. And so there is um, uh, there can be real satisfaction from working on something one deeply cares about uh, and not only seeing, um, uh, not only working on it hard uh, for its own sake, but also seeing a sense of completion in the sense of it, of it working, of it being useful. I said there were six, I actually, I miscounted. Four of them I had already come up, uh, already came up with in the article and it was the fifth, this is the new one. Uh, the notion that makes a craft a craft as distinct from a competition is that a competition must have winners and losers. Crafts do not have winners and losers, do not by their own nature have winners and losers. Um, there can be, uh, in theory, an unlimited number of craftspeople who achieve the highest levels. Uh, so let's talk about that a little. Um, uh, pottery, uh, there could be, uh, in theory, everyone, certainly every member of a, of a pottery guild could uh, be an absolutely outstanding, um, uh, be a member, uh, be an absolutely outstanding potter. That is not true for something that's a pure competition like, uh, like athletics, uh, and I would argue like sales. Uh, sales, someone will sell more than other people. There, it is not, I mean, it's mathematically possible, but it is not, it's not a real situation for everyone to sell the same amount to be, to have exactly the same outcomes. And so that, that part I had missed because of course, some coding events can be competitive. Coding can have competitive natures to it. People can get jobs from it or not, uh, just coding competitions. Uh, but if the actual pure act of coding, there is no there is no limit for who can reach the highest levels of quality. There's no there's no force limit. Whereas competitions actually um, uh, competitions actually put in uh, competitive things that are fundamentally competitive have a natural limit of who can win. So those are the five those are the five measures uh, to my mind of what is a what is a craft. As you know, of course, um, I believe that code meets this standard. So let's go through them one more time quickly. Um, is, uh, is code uh, a skill that improves with knowledge and wisdom? Of course, yes. Um, there is not a perfect correlation between more time coding and uh, more time coding and getting better at it, but it's very strongly correlated, especially if you have supporting networks around it. Um, what we know, what we're able to deliver, six months in, six years in, 20 years in is increased, especially on the wisdom side, by just seeing so many examples and so much pattern recognition that can come from uh, seeing code uh, and seeing so many situations of code and trying to solve problems through code. Second, um, is code, does code, as a craftsperson, does the coder derive pleasure from its own, for the, doing the work for its own sake? Again, obviously I think yes. Not everybody does, but it is certainly very possible, and the presence of open source uh, makes that, um, uh, I think, proves that point to me very clearly. Third, uh, can craft generate a flow state? So I read, uh, I shared in the article, I think there are 10, nine steps um, that 
Michali, the psychologist, uh, shared. I'm just going to read them because I, I just think they're so perfect for what coding feels like in the right situation. Not all of them companies get in the way, but it, when coding, when the environment is right, it really resonates with, with the coders I know. Uh, there are clear goals every step of the way, goals that could be functional requirements or non-functional requirements. There is immediate feedback to one's actions, at least at the point that you are getting a code review or um, uh, code review or seeing if the code works. Um, there is a balance between challenges and skills. So you get to keep, you have the opportunity to keep working on something that gets harder and harder and harder. That's not true, obviously, in some areas like, uh, let's say, a manufacturing line where you can get to mastery of the task and the, ver the difficulty does not vary and you can't choose to make it more difficult. Uh, action and awareness are merged. That very much sounds like coding. Uh, so there are nine of these. I won't read you all of them, but I, I do think it actually matches up quite, quite nicely. Fourth, the finished craft has to work. Well, I already talked about this. It is not enough for the code to be written cleanly uh, or elegantly uh, or understandably. Uh, as cra as coders, um, coders evaluate whether or not the code actually works and does what it's supposed to. And if not, uh, the other characteristics are uh, just don't matter. They certainly don't matter as much. And then finally, and of course I also reference this, must there does coding involve winners and losers fundamentally you can disagree with that and if you do we'd love to hear it but i would say even though there are job setting you know job situations where people come out on top or hiring or competitions as the actual nature of coding there is nothing stopping um people from getting more and more expert and more and more advanced the only limitation is um, is internal uh, or um, is to that person, uh, whether they have the, uh, the will uh, and the resources uh, and the time uh, to get better and better and better. Uh, there is no limit to each person uh, achieving mastery in a way that that is, that really is different from, from a pure competition. So then finally, part three, if you believe this uh, and you believe code, uh, code is a craft and not a competition, what should you do about it uh, if you're an engineering manager, if you're a CFO, if you're a CEO, CTO as well? Uh, and this, this again, really helped me understand why when we built our first product, it just didn't didn't work uh, in a day-to-day -day way. Um, and I've since we've since tried to really make sure we're following these lessons for, for how we run our own code. Um, one part of this is getting, putting, uh, expertise at the fingertips of developers. Uh, so if it relies on wisdom, you want as much wisdom available to you as possible, or at least if it relies on wisdom, you want as much knowledge, uh, at your fingertips as possible. So you can use wisdom to decide which situation you should use. Uh, that's why stack overflow is so freaking useful. Uh, I know, I'm sure some of you have heard people, uh, uh, in the coding community say, well, it doesn't count if you're looking it up. That's of course crazy. Um, coding is about finding the right answer. And if the right answer exists and has already been built, the hard part is figuring out which lesson to apply. Uh, second, it's not just about velocity. Uh, and I, I'm guessing if you signed up for this call, you already agree with that, but um, there's a whole bunch of outsiders to the code, to engineering teams, sales and finance and CEOs sometimes too, just why can't it go faster? Why can't why can't we just go faster? And something that requires knowledge and wisdom and judgment, speeding things up can get in the way of getting to the right answer. Uh, and the complexity and the sophistication of it, it actually produces produces a less good answer if you just have people rush because they are they're not in a flow state, they're in a frantic state. Uh, and so managing um, uh, I, you know, only solving for speed is is really dangerous. Uh, if there was a non-technical leader on the call, I'd say keep asking what are blockers to the team being effective, to the engineering team being effective, and keep getting rid of those blockers. That is your highest and best use of uh, of ultimately improving velocity, not by telling people or asking people to go faster, but by getting by getting rid of things that keep people uh, that make the lead to people going slower. 
Uh, feedback methods uh, are incredibly important uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to a craft. And so code reviews are obviously a huge part of that if they're done done the right way. Uh, paired programming, uh, mentorship, shout out to code, uh, uh, code mentor. Other ways where knowledge can be transferred is a huge part of helping teams, knowledge and skill, uh, a huge part of teams being, uh, being effective, uh, engineering teams being effective. Uh, three more. Uh, when it comes to looking at code quality, uh, we think there is a very limited role for quantitative metrics, quantitative metrics that might uh, that might serve um, that do serve well in uh, in mergers and acquisitions, so that, you know the business that we run. Uh, but day to day, when you're actually coding, the thing that matters is uh, is the subjective assessment of other coders based on their wisdom, and that's why that's why we are such passionate proponents of code reviews. Um, uh, because that is that the code review is a subjective assessment of given all the context, uh, do we think this is the right solution, uh, for this particular, uh, engineering problem? Second to last, uh, metrics about coders. We were just talking about metrics about code metrics about coders are very dangerous and should be used carefully. Um, some of you uh, may have been in organizations, hopefully not today, uh, but there used to be organizations that would count the number of lines of code that each developer would commit every day and manage people to a certain number of lines of, uh, lines of code committed. Again, I'm sure if you're on this call, you agree that that is crazy town. Um, it, <laughs> some, one, sometimes the, uh, the best coding is removing code. It's not about adding. Two, uh, in many situations, uh, I'm laughing because there's so many reasons why this is a terrible idea. Uh, a second reason it's a terrible idea is uh, sometimes the most important thing to do is to figure out what to build and how to build it. And then actually doing the building um, uh, can be relatively straightforward. So having everyone just code um, is gets in the way of the thinking that leads to the best possible answer. Um, and then the third reason, and this is if there was a non-coder uh, on the call, uh, I would say, by the way, coders are incredibly smart and methods of managing coders through, through quantitative metrics, they will just game the system. Uh, uh, it's, uh, and gaming in this case, meaning uh, carrying out behaviors that aren't, aren't in the best interest of the team, the person, the organization. This all may seem obvious, but there are other fields where that's not true. Uh, I, um, so I am a salesperson for a living as the CEO of this business. S every metric I can get on my sales performance is useful. It's useful information to help me better, at, be better at my sales function. Uh, you think about athletics, every piece of data is useful and it's not private. And it wouldn't be weird to share it, um, barring most situations. Certainly performance data, you think about the stats available from football, either world football or American football, um, how much people know quantitatively about each other as participants, as coaches, as fans. And it doesn't, doesn't run con uh, contrary to the ethos of the work, the work of playing in that case, uh, to have this quantitative information about people shared. And it absolutely does about coding. It just, I'm guessing like you, it sort of brings your shoulders up to think about having that kind of level of information about each coder available to everyone. Uh, and then finally, as a, as a, as a tactic, um, or maybe as a, a particular implementation, it's really hard to get code interviews right as part of the interviewing process. So if coding is primarily done, um, um, if coding is primarily best done without pressure, with time to reflect, with time to research, then having coding exercises with a short period of time and someone looking over your shoulder likely aren't going to generate um, the best, the most accurate assessment of another engineer uh, as if it was more like real life, where real life is time to reflect, it's not under time pressure, et cetera. 
I wouldn't claim to say that um, inter coding interviews don't have their place. Great, great, great organizations um, uh, use them and 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 uh, uh, have this as part of their of their process. But I would say use them carefully and try really hard to minimize their impact and to make the situation as um, as realistic as possible. Um, one of those ways, uh, to the extent it's, it's, it's doable for your organization, uh, is to um, uh, give is to bring folks on as um, as contractors. If you're thinking of having people join a team, so paying them, not doing free work, but having them just start participating with the team and see what they would be like in a in a work like setting. Um, the closer this is true about coding, but it's, it's certainly true about other areas as well. The closer you can uh, you can um, observe someone doing the task in the situation, the task in the work that is close to the real world, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to get an, action, an an accurate read on that person. So there you go. Uh, five reasons why uh, I believe, um, five reasons defining uh, what makes a craft, including one I forgot the first time, uh, which was uh, uh, there is no natural limit on the number of, uh, of winners of people who are achieving mastery. Uh, my deep belief that uh, coding meets that criteria, uh, all five of them. And then some implications for what does it mean if code is a craft, how to help uh, bring the best out of engineers at an organization. Um, put expertise at the fingertips of developers. Uh, don't just focus on speed. Uh, have good feedback methods, especially code reviews. Uh, focus on the subjective assessment of engineers, not about linters, um, not that you shouldn't use them, but it's, that's not the primary measure. Uh, be careful about metrics about coders uh, and try to have coding, um, uh, be careful about code interview, uh, uh, coding interviews, uh, exercises during interviews, much better to get the experience to be as close as possible to actually being a developer in the organization. And that's it. Would love to hear your thoughts or reactions or questions. You liked it, you didn't like it. Um, all right, I see one, Arpit. Um, I hope I pronounce it right. Um, is static code analysis tools considered a metric for code? Uh, so when I think of metric, I think of something that evaluates. So when I think about metrics for code, we're talking about ways of measuring, for example, code quality. Uh, there can also be static tools for code security. Uh, I'm going to keep answering it, um, and you can redirect me if I didn't get it quite right. Um, the results of static code analyses can be considered a metric for the quality of code. I think in particular security metric, security uh, results of security scans through static analysis, it's also true through dynamic security scans, but static ones, uh, is relevant. Um, we would highly recommend that any organization that is medium sized or larger have a, and small if you can afford it, but you can't always afford it, have a uh, static security scan uh, uh, running on the code uh, regularly, if not continuously, and the count of those, um, the count of security uh, security warnings is a relevant indicator of the health of the security of the code base. Now there's nuance to that. Uh, static scans produce false positives. And so the, the really, the, any measure like that needs to be treated with grains of salt uh, and also actually um, uh, actually uh, uh, have the false positives identified. Um, uh, identified. Um, but yes, I think they can measure. Um, can you share the article you wrote on this topic? I absolutely can. Let me figure out the right way to do it. If I put it in chat, will everyone see it? I think yes. Code is a craft, not a competition. Ha, ha, ha. Huh? All right. Okay. Will someone volunteer and write back? Did you see in the chat the uh, the link? Oh, the link. I didn't give you the right link. I'm sorry. 
Uh, code is a craft, not a competition. Here we go. Okay, this is the link, the second one. Um, okay, uh, Jessamine, you're very welcome. Um, uh, thank you for sharing that feedback. Uh, John, you asked, um, can you suggest ways of getting feedback as a sole developer in a startup? John, that is really hard. Uh, and if I understand you right, you are uh, the only person who has the ability to code, um, meaning like there's not like an, an engineering manager or a CTO, someone who isn't could code but isn't. Um, I don't have an easy answer, to be honest. Um, certainly, um, certainly, I would hope for you and your business that it grows fast enough that you can bring on more coders. Um, that's that, that would be great. Um, in the work context, it is possible that bringing, asking for volunteer help, um, um, such as bringing in students who, you know, I don't like doing volunteer, I'm skeptical about volunteer efforts, both, and you really have to be respectful of the people who are giving their time. Uh, but certainly if you agree to give another developer feedback, uh, it would, in my opinion, it would be super appropriate. Uh, to get a grad student uh, developer um, uh, in an unpaid internship, though of course paid would be better, if um, who would then write code, you would review their code, they would review yours, um, as long as you really gave them a great experience. Obviously, paying it, uh, paying for it, would be even better. Um, an approach you recommend for someone looking to break into a tech from a non-coding background, or should I go to school, back to school, or a boot camp? I love that question. I have a very strong point of view. Uh, I am a founding volunteer with the Open Source Welcome Committee. Um, so open source, of course, code welcome, uh, open to everyone. A welcome committee trying to give a guide to um, how to join open source. Um, I didn't really know a lot about participating in open source a year ago, and then I really got to know it, and I could not be more of a strong proponent of using open source code becoming involved with open source as the absolute, absolute best way to get involved. Let me find you the article. Uh, it's at um, open source welcome committee, OSWC.is. Um, um, let's do resources. Um, it's There's an article called 15 steps to using open source to advance your career as an early tenure developer. And the, the the really high level version is um, if you know nothing about it, go to free code camp um, and take courses, tutorials from that until you get the basics. Because um, you want to get to what I call advanced beginner rather than pure beginner. Once you're at advanced, because otherwise you're wasting people's time. Once you're at advanced beginner, then you can start volunteering with open source projects, which is. Um, John, if you had time, <laughs> another way to get feedback. Um, I would, if you're working in a startup, I would do everything you can to make that startup successful because great things will flow from that. Uh, but open source is another place to go and get feedback from others. Uh, and that website uh, that I shared also has links to individual projects that are uh, particularly open to newcomers, uh, as well as collections uh, and organizations that, that collect information for, for newcomers. Any other questions or comments? Well, it's a very prompt group. Um, you're welcome, John. Thank you very much for asking. Um, thank you all so much uh, for spending a half hour of your day with me. I would love to hear from you if you have feedback or things that I missed. And I wish you a wonderful afternoon and a great rest of your week. Take care, everybody, and thank you.